Back to the Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. Welcome back to the Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. Today, we've got Bahan Ajamian. He is the Capital Markets Advisor for High Tide. Bahan, thanks for being with us at the Talking Hedge. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you get into the industry? How did you become a Capital Markets Advisor for High Tide? Uh, I believe they are publicly traded on NASDAQ, right? Ticker symbol yep. HITI. Correct. Yep. And on the Toronto uh, Venture Exchange. Yep. Um, yeah. So, uh, so yeah. So, my background is in capital markets. Um, so, you know, fresh out of school, I did my four years at uh, KPMG, got my designations and realized, okay, I wanted to get into the uh, into where more the action was. So, uh, joined TD Securities uh, in equity research, was there for about seven years, um, then joined Beacon Securities in 2014. Um, January as, a, as an analyst covering stocks um, and sort of, you know, fell into cannabis in 2016 as, uh, you know, we we're looking for growth stocks and this is a you know, growth, growth opportunity that was fantastic. So uh, I started covering the stocks to, starting in 2016, um, the traditional sort of, you know, the, the Canadian licensed producers at the time. And then I was the first one to cover the U.S. company, the U.S. opportunity, the U.S. companies, taking them public, etc. We sort of focused on that. And that's where I met Raj back in 2017, um, you know, obviously before legalization happened in Canada. And, uh, you know, he came in as an analyst with his slide deck saying, you know, I've got 19 accessory shops uh, across Canada, mostly in Western Canada. And, you know, we know that cannabis is becoming legal next year. And um, look, uh, you know, we have we, we want to be able to leverage these shops into selling actual cannabis, right? He had the foresight to know that people are not going to go to a dispensary and buy cannabis and then go to his accessory shops and buy accessories, right? So the plan was, um, for him to get them all licensed, take it public, build out the biggest network uh, coast to coast uh, for, for accessories and mm-hmm. cannabis. It's an interesting perspective being able to get to see kind of a lot of these uh, equities on a screen, kind of get to know the companies through their valuations and the way that uh, they work, whether it's you know thinly traded or, or otherwise, um, at least similar to my experience, I've found that to be kind of fascinating uh, prior to jumping into the cannabis industry myself. Um, and I've gone through my own uh, issues of trying to pivot to stay relevant, get maybe too early to the industry with the cannabis cafe, for example. Um, you yourself, you've jumped into the industry. You have experience working with MedMen. That was the uh, MSO darling of the industry and has, has since kind of um, plummeted back down to reality. Tell me a little bit about that experience. I, I tend to say that practice doesn't make perfect failure does. And maybe that's one of those examples where things weren't implemented the right way. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about what you learned and maybe what happened? Yeah, well, I guess there's two parts of it, right? So the first part is like what I learned, you know, moving from being an analyst to being, uh, you know, part of a, an issuer, right? Is, um, you know, when, you, when, you're, when you're the analyst, you know, every, once every three months, you see the numbers and all you expect is, well, they better be higher than last time. And here's my number and here's what they come in. Ultimately, just numbers on a piece of paper. But when you join the issuer and you're part of the team, it's, at least it was a shock for me to see how much work and effort and strategy goes into making sure those numbers are higher this quarter than last quarter, right? It's, I think when, you, when you're in equity markets, you're, you know, you're pretty much in a silo where you and your associate or you and the, you know, the head of research and that's it. But when you're part of a company, you're, there's a much broader team, legal strategy, ops, et cetera. Um, you know, and as for MedMen, uh, you know, look, as you said, they, they had lots of things lined up for them. They were, you know, when I joined, they were still private, um, you know, uh, very well positioned. Um, I think the biggest thing we learned there is uh, you have to make money, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you have to run your operations with a keen eye to profitability, to EBITDA. And that's something that really attracted me to Raj, where, again, he started this with you know $48,000, um, basically him and his wife. Um, and when you do that, you have a different mentality than, hey, let's take something public, raise other people's money, and maybe it'll work out. But no, no, this has been my baby for 12 years. It's been all my money, even when it went public, he owned about 45% of the company. So it's, uh, it's a very different, you know, there's the brand building part of it, but it's a very different approach that I thought that we want to make sure everything we do as an ROI is good for shareholders um, and actually makes money as opposed to just, you know, brand build, building at, you know, infinity. Maybe tell the audience a little bit about how you guys are making money because you're the number one LP up in Canada based on revenue. So you're clearly- Number one re- re- retailer. Thank you. Thank you. I said, yeah. LP, yeah. Thank and you. store count. Yeah. 
So um, that's great. People are obviously ordering maybe online or in person. Can you tell us about consumer behavior, how they're buying, as well as how did you get to that level of being the number one retailer in Canada by revenue? So a, a lot of it is just execution, right? Um, so we had a bit of a head start in that, you know, we, when, when we went public, we had about 19 accessory shops in, in Western Canada. Um, we were already public when legalization happened. So we had some access to capital and we had history for about 10 years of you know, catering to the cannabis consumer. But until then, we can only sell them accessories, of course, but now we can actually sell them cannabis. So we had real estate, we had mind share, we had market share, we had vertical integration through the accessories. Um, and then really comes down to, to, to Raj and his team, right? So we've put up, we have 104 stores now, um, which makes us the third largest you know, corporately owned anywhere, Canada, US, et cetera. Um, and I think what's, what's really interesting there is the vast majority of those have been opened up organically, right? So we made one large acquisition, which was the acquisition of Meta, which closed about a year ago. Um, and that added about 30 something stores. But if you look at the other 70 odd stores, uh, we almost all were, were, were put up organically by us, right? And in order to do that, the amount of human resources and construction and branding and staffing and um, you know, inventory management that goes in, I mean, you need a, you know, promotions, you need a big, big team um, mm -hmm. that, that know what they're doing and can make it all done on a way that we actually make profits as opposed to, you know, we're, we're constantly in this case state of building out and, uh, you know, the profits will come one day. As, as we see, when, when you mentioned the licensed producers, I mean, three years into legalization, um, you know, there's a very big difference between the way licensed producers have been uh, you know, fa faring, most of them, and, uh, and the way the retailers have been faring. How do you decide on those locations? 104 is a lot. In, in each state, there's a, a limit, you know, five, maybe six stores on average, there's, there's this limit. So nobody really knows. Um, and, you know, the MSOs, of course, they have multiple states that they have. But right. how do you get to 104 stores? How do you decide on that? You said organically. Uh, but what is the strategy? You know, when we look at other main street uh, examples where Burger King chooses to utilize McDonald's multi-million dollar uh, team to decide on where McDonald's is going to pop up. And then Burger King just kind of comes in, spends zero money on it and decides to open up right next door. How do you guys decide on where to open up and how? So, so the, that also depends on each province right now, things are rolling out. So in, in the beginning, again, we had 19 stores. Um, from the accessories land that we kind of took over and got the majority of them licensed to sell cannabis. So we already had some real estate that we could leverage, you know, when, when, when the light turned green and, and we were able to, 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 to move. Um, in each province, it's a little bit different. So in Alberta, we have the majority of our stores right now, or the largest amount of our stores, uh, there are zoning restrictions. So mm -hmm. depending on the municipality, you have to be 250 meters, 150 meters, 100 meters, 300 meters, et cetera, away from other cannabis stores. In Ontario, so you have a little bit of a moat there where nobody can come up literally right next to you. So you don't have that McDonald's Burger King example you just mentioned. In Ontario, where we have 31 stores, um, it's a little bit different. So the uh, so there, the the rule is you can uh, as long as you're 150 meters away from a school, that's the only restriction that applies. So you could literally have two stores that are right next to each other as long as they're each 150 meters or more away from a school. So Ontario rolled out a little bit unique, where in the beginning, there were only 25 licenses uh, given out by a lottery for almost 15 million people. Then they issued another 50 by a lottery, and then they just opened it up for everybody. So all of a sudden, we went from, you know, a year and change ago, there were less than 100 stores, and uh, the big problem, there's not enough, to now there's about 1,200 stores with another 700 in the queue, and now people are worried about clustering, right, especially downtown, because this happened for our original stores you know, two, three years ago. Everybody wanted to be downtown when there was a limited no, no, number of them. So, you know, Young Street, Queen Street, Toronto, uh, King Street, um, where, you know, the tr there's a lot of pedestrian traffic. That's where people put up their first stores. Now those areas are very, very saturated. So for the past year, year and a half, our entire focus has been more of these strip malls, right? So you're not, you know, fighting out to the death you know, with three different people on one, score, on one street corner, you're focused on a strip mall, a plaza, for example, you know, I drive five kilometers to get to my nearest Costco. And if there was a cannabis store there, I would probably be shopping there when I go to Costco, right? And you're the only one there because, you know, obviously we have, uh, in, in these strip malls, they don't allow more than one 
cannabis retailer. So you're the only one there. You're bringing people in from a much wider radius as opposed to, uh, you know, fighting it out with two other guys for one street corner. And especially given our size, our track record, the fact that we're public, um, you know, we're able to get these uh, these coveted leases. So the real estate strategy is a little bit different uh, depending on which province and in some cases municipality you're in. Mm hmm. What are you seeing in terms of uh, some of the moratoriums like New Jersey has 75% where they just decided not to allow any stores at all. Um, and there was a report that came out from headset kind of showcasing between Washington State and Colorado how many sales two to three X over the average when you're on a border uh, to Idaho or, or another, um, you know, state that doesn't allow. Are you seeing similar uh, increases on on the borders of, of uh, you know, location, like small towns and cities and municipalities that don't allow for cannabis? Are you seeing greater sales in those areas? In, in Ontario, um, again, when it started in 2018, each municipality was given the option to opt in or opt out. Mm -hmm. um, and most of them opted in, but there are sizable communities that have decided to opt out. And we are seeing, you know, more traffic on stores that are you know, near the border of the opt-in side, where the entire municipality next, you know, across the street doesn't have any, right? Mm -hmm. So there is a little bit of that happening. Um, there, there was one municipality, uh, Pickering, which is just to the east of, of Toronto, where they had originally opted out, and then they saw, you know, all the doomsday scenarios of cannabis, uh, you know, whether it's youth use or drug driving, um, didn't really materialize. And instead, they got jobs and taxes, and obviously, uh, retail sector in general has been decimated by by COVID nineteen. Um, so now they went from opting out to deciding to opt in. So we're optimistic that um, you know, so some of the other larger municipalities that have opted out may eventually opt in and you know increase the the size of the market. Um, it's not like people are not consuming cannabis in those locations. To your point, they're either driving across the border to the municipality next door, or perhaps they still have their you know, illicit dealers that they uh, have had for a long time. Um, the illicit market is still 40 to 50 percent of the Canadian market, uh, obviously, depending on the province, et cetera. Hmm. Are the consumer behaviors any different? I mean, I know you can't really extrapolate on on the, the legacy market too much, but maybe you could tell us a little bit about what people are doing in your stores. How are, how are they responding post-pandemic? What are they buying? I mean, flour is still the largest form factor, right? Flour and pre-rolls are you know, together close to 65, 70%, right? Um, so, you know, you, the largest consumer is that, you know, I've been consuming for a long time. It's almost like the 80-20 rule. Right? Your heavier users drive more of your revenue, right? Um, and they tend to be flower users, right? Now, now we are seeing other formats increase. Um, the edibles, the drinks, uh, the vape pens are, are the, the, the best performers of the call it 2.0 categories. Um, but we, you know, we are seeing, um, and that's a big, big push that we made for the discount club model, is, uh, is to see that acceleration from the illicit market to the actual you know, regulated market, right? And the three main drivers of um, you know, how you compete with the illicit market are price, which has gone much better over the last three years, quality, which again, has continues to get better, and uh, convenience, right? So before it was, well, there wasn't a store 20 kilometers away. Now there's a store you know, relatively close by. And now in almost every province of, of, of major sizes, we can deliver. So now, you know, well, you know, if, if, the, if the original push, maybe a push back a year ago was, well, why would I go to a store when I have a dealer who could deliver, deliver it for cheaper? Mm -hmm. Now, you know, that, that no longer exists, that, that argument. I want to I touch base on that argument, but first I want to I go to why people are going to the legacy market. If the black market is 40%, like you said, and price and convenience are one of the top two decision makers, is it cheaper and better on the legacy market? Because I know I go to my, you know, I'll put it in quotes, my medical marijuana provider, because I can get $500 pounds of um, pretty decent, you know, sun-grown outdoor cannabis. Um, and it's convenient. So rather than going in and have limitations of, of 28 grams a day and going in and paying only $10 more, it's not about price, it's about convenience. I want to be able to get all of it and just kind of get it when I want it. Um, so having said all of that, why are people going back to the legacy market up in Canada? So, so some of them are, you know, they have ex existing relationships um, with, with, with their providers, but we're seeing, um, you know, it's gone from 100 to 40% in you know, less than three years, 
right? And so, you know, I think I think that's going to keep accelerating. I mean, even in Colorado, um, it took a long, long time to get where it is, but it still exists. Right. Mm-hmm. We're seeing some prices down here in, in the States with inflation. I, I can't imagine you guys are avoiding those from beef jerky to gasoline and, and everywhere in between. Um, same store sales in the U.S. seem to have pricing coming down as less people are ordering online. The minimum order in California, for example, was $65 per, per order. Now, uh, after, after after about May, that's been coming down the last like five months in a row. As more, I'm, I'm assuming that people are going into the stores, buying less and bringing that average purchase price down. And so I'm curious... Um, if you're seeing same sale, same store sales decreasing in orders and or consumer behavioral changes, maybe consuming or buying less. I mean, they may be, they may be buying more because in California, there's more transactions, like 300,000 more transactions. So maybe they're going into the store more often buying less. I don't know. What are you seeing? Yeah. I mean, the, the Inflation is creeping up, right? We're all seeing the headlines. We're not at the point in our stores we're really seeing a decrease. What where we have seen um, for the last few years is a decrease in price per gram, right? Mm-hmm. And up till about six months ago, um, it was pretty much you know all the decline was being eaten by the licensed producers, right? And the retailers were able to hold their margin. Um, but now we're at the point where there is more competition um, among the retailers, um, so prices uh, have been coming down, and uh, and that was again part of the reason why we decided to enact about a month or so ago our, our discount club model concept, right? To make sure we had you know the unbeatable prices and offers, um, and and we're really seeing, um, especially when the three pilots we did before we decided to make that change on mass, um, we did see sales at our stores pick up between 75 and 100 percent. Um, just on the three pilots we did in three different provinces, uh, people didn't really respond um, to to, the, to having the everyday low prices. In the U.S., we have vertical integration. So you have a producer, the brand, and the retailer that's all owned in one. In some states, Washington State doesn't have that. Other states do. Um, and so what we're seeing in California is direct to consumer sales, bypassing the retailers. So anybody who spent, you know, $10, $20 million on a license is sort of getting, uh, you know, the, the workaround. <laughs> uh, and so for anybody, um, let me rephrase the question. Are you concerned at all that in the advent of federal legalization and global legalization that direct to consumer model could affect high tides revenue not not for canada i mean so in canada um you know again as as you mentioned you generally speaking you can't be vertically integrated because you can't be vertically integrated if you're going to be in ontario which is almost half the market right for in terms of wherever the the private sector can play right so um i guess in theory you could be vertically integrated and only sell in manitoba and, and alberta but I mean, that, that's not the bulk of the market, right? So uh, the, in terms of the LP is going direct to consumers um, in, you know, in Canada, the way the rules are written, you can only do that through medical. So through medical cannabis, um, you can buy directly from your LP, comes in the mail. That's been around for a long, long time, right? But everything recreational um, has been, you know, been going directly through retailers, right? And uh, each province has its own different way of rolling things out and who can own what in terms of retail, who can qualify and how many you can have in any given province at any given time. But recreational cannabis has always been through uh, retailers in Canada. How would that change if, if U.S. federal legalization changed? There was a bill, a Republican-led bill that went through uh, just a few days ago. I think that was last Friday. Um, and so curious, like if federal legalization does happen, um, you've already seen Aurora and Canopy have to write off a billion and three billion because they overbuilt some of their greenhouses. If if uh, global legalization were to open up and you saw Colombia coming in for you know under a dollar, that would impact some of those those growers. But how would the direct sales, if you could go across borders, be impacted? Are, are you guys looking at diversifying, trying to come into the U.S. similar to Canopy growth? <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, well, there's there's two different aspects of that. I mean, Canada has been federally legal now for three years, right? Mm-hmm. And so that the setup is pretty much set, right? So I don't think U.S. federal legalization will impact the way we um, sell cannabis in Canada. I mean, that's all you know, federal. You know, that, that that's that, that case has been settled here in Canada for a couple of years, right? And it's for the United States. We definitely have big plans to enter the United States in terms of cannabis. Um, so right now, what we're doing is. Um, 
basically the same template that we had in Canada, we were replicating in the United States. So the company again started about 12 years ago um, selling accessories uh, again with, with one person. And then uh, Raj went out and he got li um, licenses, coveted licenses. So for example, Snoop Dogg, Chi Chin Chong, Sony Pictures, et cetera. He got the, the rights for them about 10 years ago to go out and make accessories with their likeness on, hmm. right? So he, we were number one in Canada for accessories before cannabis became legal. Now that cannabis is legal, a few years in, we're number one selling cannabis. In the United States, it's this pretty similar strategy. Uh, we have accessories resellers that we have as accessories online platforms, and we have CBD platform, uh, which we required this year called Fab CBD. Um, so we have about two and a half million customers that have bought accessories from us that are in our database, um, which uh, obviously we sell to in every single state. Um, and it's, it's the same overall playbook. Once we get federal legalization, the play would be to take these, the existing um, you know, market share customer relationships that we have with for accessories and try to leverage that to selling cannabis online, right? Just like we did in Canada, we leverage the real estate, the customer relationships. You do the same thing now, but rather than you know, when it's 12 years later, you don't want to be number one in you know, brick and mortar accessories, right? You now you want to be number one, two, and five in, in online accessories. And that's what we are in the United States with the, with the platforms that we've acquired, right? So grasscity.com, smokecartel.com, dailyhighclub.com. Those are three of the top five you know, highest traffic uh, websites for accessories in the world. We own them all. We also own a smaller one called Bankstop. So, you know, I know Canopy and some of the other Canadian companies, they're making these options types agreements. They give you some money now. And then when, you know, when the if and when comes, we can actually acquire your business for X multiple or X dollars, right? That's something we're looking at, we're considering. Um, but ultimately, you know, you're still, you're paying cash now when you're sitting on your hands and waiting for the if and when, right? So we might do that to supplement the strategy. But in, right now in the United States, we're making $50 million Canadian annualized run rate today and all of it being EBITDA profitable. So if it, you know, if, if federal legalization happens in six weeks or in a couple of years, you know, that's fine with us. We can just keep growing our existing business that's federally legal because we're on the NASDAQ, CBD and accessories. We go deeper with customers. And then eventually when we get the green light, we look to leverage those strengths, which would be even deeper to becoming you know, a big player in, in actually selling cannabis. Tell me about the distribution e-commerce. Is that a strength? Um, I feel like a lot of the retired athletes in the U.S. that came out with CBD brands, uh, they're in two dozen stores, but they just don't quite have the sales um, because they, I don't think they, they valued really the distribution and you know, what e-commerce could do for them. Uh, we've even seen Willie Nelson leave Washington State because his revenues weren't good. A lot of states uh, in cannabis don't really care about the... Um, you know, the, those, the, the, um, celebrity brand, celebrity athletes, anything like that, uh, Snoop Dogg's leaf by Snoop in California is not as popular as cookies and no one knows who burner is. So I, I think there's kind of a disconnect. I would agree that, um, accessories and stuff. Absolutely. If it's Cheech and Chong or not the Cheech and Chong, uh, papers are going to sell faster and better, but there's still within the industry, I think a lack of awareness on the importance of distribution and e-commerce, uh, and yet you guys have kind of doubled down and, and bought a lot of these different platforms. Um, how is it impacting your bottom line? And, and what is the impact to the industry in your opinion? I've already kind of given you mine and, and how I feel it could help, you know, athletes and celebrities in general. Um, but where are you seeing it in terms of your bottom line? Well, distribution is a huge part of our business, right? So we have about, um, again, for the last decade that we've been working on over 5,000 SKUs that we design, manufacture, mostly in China and elsewhere overseas, import and wholesale and retail, right? So we have our own SKUs and we, when we acquire these businesses that sell accessories online retail, right? What we found is the first one we bought, uh, which was Grass City, which we acquired in 2018. Um, this is again, the number one oldest, largest head shop in the online head shop in the world. It was based in Amsterdam. And uh, you know, Raj bought it again, 2018, right before the company went public. And he saw, well, you have about 80% of your customers are living in the United States and you're fulfilling all these orders from Amsterdam where people are waiting 10, 14 days to get their product. I mean, you know, he says, as a pure operator said, well, this doesn't make any sense. Acquired the company, set up a distribution warehouse in Las Vegas, and now it's fulfilling the U.S. orders from that facility. 
And what we saw is the uh, top line has tripled since we bought it in 2018. Mm. And the percentage of SKUs, because they were a customer of ours, even, even when we bought it, they sold about, you know, two or three percent of what they sold was you know high tides actual products that we design manufacture now it's about 50 percent on a top line that's tripled right and so in the other platforms that we've bought smoke cartel the dank stop daily high club i mean it's similar in that you're reaching more and more people but it's also an opportunity for you to be more vertically integrated and push your own SKUs. Mm. and each one of these comes with a little bit of you know, different flavors so for example grass city is your traditional retailer we have a bunch of inventory we sell it online Whereas Smoke Cartel is, has a unique drop shipping technology that Sean, that the Sean Gang, the CTO of Smoke Cartel, uh, developed. So when we acquired them, now we're in the process of taking that technology and, and implementing across the rest of our businesses. So the, I think the online business, um, especially through COVID, has done very, very well. Um, you know, COVID has, has you know, really accelerated um, you know, online purchasing industry in general and uh, in our platforms, um, be it the CBD ones and the accessory ones have definitely uh, have definitely benefited. So you've got the distribution, the e-commerce, and then I'm assuming a subscription model with the um, discount club. What's the what's the revenue model on that? On, on Daily High Club? The discount club model. Oh, so, so, well, there's, so there's the subscription for accessories is online with Daily High Club. Okay. We have about 13,000 people that buy uh, you can either buy a product once and leave the store or you can sign up for a subscription, right? And then it's, you know, recurring revenue. Um, and then the discount club model that we implemented in Canada uh, about a month ago, that is for our brick and mortar cannabis business and accessories. So what we did was one, we, we saw that, the, you know, the market was becoming more competitive in Canada. Um, they were becoming more and more value players, putting pressure on margins, you know, in, intra-retailer competition. Um, and the first thing we did was say, well, let's do a couple of pilots before we do anything you know, too drastic. Um, the first thing we did is we led by accessories because we are the only ones that are vertically integrated in accessories. We initially, back over the summer, um, when you walk into our stores, you could see a, for, for example, if you have a water pipe or you know, any type of accessory, a member price and then the market price. And the member prices were significantly cheaper. So for example, a $50 product may only be $13 or $17 for a member price. And because we design, manufacture, and import these accessories, we're still making a very healthy margin, even on the member price. And what we saw, but obviously you have to be a member of our loyalty plan to sign to to actually buy it at that price. And so we saw when we were getting about twenty to thirty thousand signups a year for our loyalty plan, we're now getting seventy thousand a quarter instead of twenty or thirty. Instead of moving five thousand accessories a week, we're now moving over twenty thousand. And so then we did a pilot using the same thing for cannabis, a member price and the market price. And of the three stores that we implemented this on without any fanfare or advertising, just kind of quietly in each store, we saw sales go up between 75 and 100% after a few months. So we said, okay, this is the way we're going to be leading to our discount club model. Um, it's obviously a model off of, you know, other retailers that have similar platforms, similar programs. Um, basically, you know, it's everyday low prices. We lead with accessories. We're coming out with our own white label products. We bring the, the two CBD brands that we own, from one from the US, which is Fab CBD, and one from the UK, which is Bless CBD. Bring them you know, on, on a, a preferred basis to our stores up in Canada, push those products in our, you know, 104 stores. Um, and then you move more tonnage for the licensed producers. You can get, you know, better deals in terms of white label. And you really get that, you know, discount club model, loyalty feedback loop. Um, so that's, uh, you know, it's been about a month since we implemented it and we're really pleased with how it's going. Right now, there is no model for uh, charging. Um, it's free to sign up. So we're getting a lot of people signing up. But down the road, once you reach a critical mass, we're over 250,000 right now. But once you reach a critical mass, you, know, you can find ways to monetize that. Is it public to know how many paying, or you don't have paying subscribers? Okay, what about, not, on, not on the brick and mortar side. We do on the accessory side. What about the average amount that they're spending? Is that, is that public? They've, they definitely spend more, between 10 and 20% more. Um, and now we're seeing the, the one stat that we've always been uh, highlighting out to the market is that over 50% of our daily transactions come from our loyalty member plan, members. So, you know, you have a, and even as the number of subscribers has increased, the percentage of daily transaction has remained over 50 and it has been heading higher. So we have is, you know, a loyal block of customers that are cons consistently going to our store, which is exactly what you want as a retailer.
right? We yeah. send them text messages, you know, every you know couple of days or weeks with pr promotions, et cetera. Make sure we stay on top of them and, and, and their closest store. Bond, do you have a cutoff date for uh, Christmas delivery, you know, for presents? Uh, not really. I mean, so we do have online in most provinces. Um, and uh, yeah, what, what about your, what about your, your, you got your Vegas warehouse too, for a lot of the North, for a lot of the U S customers that, so if they're yeah. on online and they're shopping um, being that everything is kind of uh, being delayed right now, uh, whether it's Amazon or, or the USPS, um, maybe the post up there in Canada is slow too. I don't know. But do you happen to know like when people should order in order to get it by the holidays? I mean, uh, my advice would be the sooner the better, right? <laughs> Generally speaking, uh, we've had like every other industry, uh, logistical problems getting getting product in from China, right? The, the availability of containers, the backlog at ports, um, you know, we're not immune to any of that. And uh, if you look at uh, how much more expensive it is to get these containers, if you can even find them, um, there's the, we you know, our, our wholesale business has about $3 million of you know, back orders that we just can't fulfill. We even, uh, you know, we had somebody today say, Vaughn, we need you to make us some accessories. Um, and I said, look, you know, we'd love to set up a whole white label line for you, but, you know, we're not in a position to be able to execute and actually get that product for X months. So let's, you know, let's wait for a few months and, and see how the supply chain unfolds. Yeah, unpack that a little bit because I, on a good day, it was really, really hard to get cones, um, a lot of people were, were short on a good day. Now you have all the supply chain issues on top of that. How have you guys been able to handle that? I mean, it's, you, you do, you, you do what you, what you, your best given the situation, right? Um, so, and again, in the U S I was at our, over the summer, I was in our facility in Las Vegas and, you know, we weren't getting any containers and all of a sudden four came in mm -hmm. at more or less the same time. And they all pretty much went out very quickly because everything, most of the items are already on back order, right? Mm -hmm. In Canada, what we decided to do is, especially as we pivoted to the discount club model, um, is to make sure that over time to wind down the wholesale business uh, for accessories. So you can only get our SKUs of accessories in our store and make it you know, much more proprietary, right, for our customers. Um, and also, with, if it's practically speaking, there, as I mentioned, there, the volume of, of our accessories has gone up about fourfold since we implemented this plan uh, for leading by accessories back over the summer. Um, and then, um, you know, we want to make sure we have enough accessories for our customers, right? Given the you know, shortage you know, due, to, due to the supply chain. So you've heard about canopy growth dropping 300 million on Wana Brands, an edibles company, um, with the contingency of U.S. federal legalization. I'm curious about your position as a capital markets advisor. What you think professionally and or personally about that deal? Again, it's an options deal. You know, the first big one was done by Canopy a few years ago when you know they had the deal with Acreage, and then they sort of renegotiated you know a few months or so afterwards. Look, I think it's it's one valid way for Canadian companies to try to get U.S. exposure without you know getting kicked off the you know the exchanges that they're on, right? Whether it's the NYSE, the Nasdaq, the Toronto Stock Exchange, et cetera, right? Um, you know, with the Canopy experience, you know, it's been a couple of years now since they first did it, right? So the money has gone out, and they're waiting for federal legalization, which you know we all know is inevitable. Um, you know, so I think it can be for the right company. It can be a positive way to enter the United States, um, but for us, it would just be if we ever did one, it would be sort of supplemental, right? We already have our strategy, we already have our customers, we're doing everything federally in the United States. This might, you know, supplement for the if and when, but we're not putting, you know, all our eggs in one basket waiting for it. We have a different strategy that you know we can lead with, right? And um, non-plant touching companies, I guess that's that's the big difference there. Um, there's some OTC companies that are non-compliant. So JP Morgan actually just announced that they were not going to allow uh, for any of those companies to be traded on, on JP Morgan's platform. Um, did you have any opinions on that going down? I mean, you guys are traded on NASDAQ under uh, HITI, so it doesn't really matter. But what do you think about JP Morgan kind of throwing that out there? I mean, every bank has its own regulatory, you know, people, the regulatory group, their risk management group, they got to make their decisions for themselves. I mean, from where I sit, you know, U.S. operators are legally able to trade in Canada on the CSC, or trade on OTC. Um, you know, I guess everyone's back office has to make their own call. 
um, you know, for us, we, we uh, uplisted to the NASDAQ. It wasn't, um, you know, took about six months to get there. And it's not cheap um, to be a relatively small cannabis company. We're over 500 million market cap right now. But um, to list on the NASDAQ, it's, uh, it's very significant in terms of insurance, in terms of filing fees, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of, uh, you know, the U.S. operators, um, you know, they're at a, you know, the reality is they're at a logistical disadvantage. With, 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 Sorry to cut you off. I was wondering if you knew if Jamie Dimon's got a crystal ball where he's seeing this Republican led bill come in for federal legalization and just wanting to, to cover uh, to cover his bases by getting rid of the OTC equities. Um, do you think that federal legalization on, on the on the US level is, is happening? Is that maybe why he decided to do that? Or is it just compliance? I, mean, I think in this case, again, not knowing the particulars, it's probably just compliance. Um, but that said, I mean, there is definite momentum, right, to where, where things are going. There was a lot of euphoria, um, you know, obviously back in February, March of this year, um, when you saw all the stocks, you know, run on 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 the hope that things will be legalized imminently. Um, now, I think, you know, we're seeing more of a, you know, a, a slow and steady approach. Right now, you get to see Republicans with their, with their bill, you know, moving on. But um, I think, you know, more likely we'll get banking. Um, you know, amendments or banking reform for cannabis in the nearer term, um, but it'll probably still be a, a while until we get full-blown federal legalization. Again, for us, it doesn't really matter if your legalization mm-hmm. happened imminently. We're ready to go. We're ready, you know, we have our distribution warehouses. We have our two and a half billion customers. If it takes longer, well, that's good too, because we'll keep building the CBD and, and accessories business until then. Well, you guys have had first mover advantages though. So having access to, to banking and capital and being able to go public how has that uh, impacted your ability to be a going concern? Oh, it's it's definitely helped, right? By being we're federally legal, right? That's where um, you, you can list on the Nasdaq. You can, you know, we, we've gone from two analysts to five analysts, right? And there's probably more that are coming in terms of wanting to cover our stock. And in terms of the balance sheet, um, you know, we we did two equity offerings this year, and uh, last month we announced bank financing, right? So we got a bank uh, ATB up here in Canada. Um, they gave us a $10 million facility with the accordion for another 15. So, you know, depending on, um, you know, meeting all those criteria, we have $25 million of bank debt, um, you know, call it five and change percent, uh, which in the cannabis world is, uh, is very difficult to get. Um, but we were, we were able to get it because we we're all, everything we do is federally legal, EBITDA focused. Uh, we have enough scale and, and track record right now. Okay. That's great. Um, we talked about a lot. Bahan, is there anything that I left out that uh, you want to cover at this point? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much for, for having me and for you know helping us uh, spread awareness of High Tide. I think you know, the, the biggest problem that we still have um, regarding High Tide shares and, and how it's sort of perceived in the market is what I'd call like the overall Canada problem, right? As you mentioned, a lot of licensed producers, a few years into legalization, EBITDA is still massively negative, inventory write-downs, they're shuttering facilities that they spent hundreds of millions of building. Um, and, uh, and I think that in a way in the market helps paint Canada with a negative brush, right? But I think what investors are slowly starting to find out is, wait a minute, the retailers are a completely different segment. They don't have this huge CapEx. They have in some cases like ours, really high revenue, really good profitability. Um, so it, it is really retail in general is a different asset class in Canada than the licensed producers. Later on to that, us with our U.S. strategy, which is over you know, $50 million annualized today, all of it even the positive. The U.K. business we recently acquired, um, which is blessed, again, makes 60% EBITDA margins in the U.K. selling CBD. Um, and then the ultimate potential there, I think um, you know, people need to dig a little deeper into high tide and what we have going on um, rather than just doing a knee-jerk, oh, well, Canada's a tough market, um, you know, sort of dismissive attitude that, that happens. That said, our shares have been done phenomenally well over the past 12 months so you know maybe slowly but surely word is getting out there's a lot that's going to be happening you know over the next uh few years as as 2.0 develops and probably see flower drop to a 40 percent market share and vapes and these other categories you mentioned that are increasing will continue to increase the only thing that we can guarantee is that change will continue to happen in the cannabis industry so where is your crystal ball at where do you think the industry is going to be at in 2022 and beyond? And what are uh, one or two goals that High Tide has in order to keep their first mover advantages? 
So in, in, in terms of Canada, I mean, the goals are to keep increasing our, our store footprint, right? So whether it's acquisitions or organic, we're about 104 this right now. We'll end the year at about 110 and next year about 105. Long-term goal is to get to 200. Um, so we can be very meaningful in terms of the market share. Um, but, you know, again, we'd like to say uh, Canada is still the warm-up, right? I mean, Canada, as much as a difficult market as it is, if you can thrive, if you can make money, um, you know, ultimately uh, the, the U.S. is the biggest prize. Um, and, and we're making sure we're, we're well positioned uh, to be able to take advantage of that as soon as we can. Mm -hmm. Some might think that's a lot, but I think we have 200 Starbucks in downtown Seattle alone. I think Hamilton had 175 dispensaries just a few years ago in, in Southern Ontario. Is, is that the name of the town I'm thinking of? Yeah, it's, yeah, about an hour from Toronto, not even. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, so have, one of, we have one of our first stores was in Hamilton. Yeah, that was interesting to, to roll down there and kind of looking around and see how many stores there were. So um, yeah. not, not too shabby of a goal. Looking forward to seeing how that rolls out. Um, so I think what we're going to do is uh, throw some links in there for your LinkedIn if people want to contact you. Um, you're on social media. I assume you guys have a website. Where are you guys at? Yeah. Uh, Hightideinc.com um, is, is our website for the corporate entity. Um, in terms of the brick and mortar store, it's canicabana.com. Then obviously we have the you know, Fab CBD, Bless CBD, Smoke Cartel, Grass City, you know, accessories websites okay. from more of a consumer perspective. But the corporate yeah. website is hightideinc.com. All right. You guys can find everything else from there. So I think with that, yep. we're going to roll this one up. I want to thank my guest, Vahan Ajamian. Um, sorry, Vahan Ajamian. He is the Capital Markets Advisor for High Tide. Vahan, thanks for being with us at The Talking Hedge. Thank you so much. Take I care. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, or don't. And I'm out. With that, we're going to roll this one up. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, or don't. And I'm out. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out and check out these other videos that we've got.